All right. So, um, so you were asking me about sort of prep uptake and, and additional barriers that we're continuing to see. Is that correct? Right. Any progress or like stalling that we so definitely so there definitely has been progress in prep uptake within the community over the past several years. Uh, unfortunately, I think there's still a large percentage of individuals who remain at risk who um, who are not on prep. And I think it's a little a little bit complex as far as what these barriers are. I think they stem from various levels. One are you know, within the medical system themselves itself, for example, among uh, perception of HIV risk, stigma from the healthcare system or providers, partners, friends, uh, distrust of the healthcare system. Then at the patient level, there's um, an awareness for example, or poor awareness of PrEP within the community, for example. There is access issues uh, that may be related to either an understanding of the medical system, uh, accessibility, uh, cost, um, and concern for medication side effects um, or interactions with other meds, uh, for example. So I think, I think barriers to care are multifaceted and complex and stem from multiple levels uh, within the system. And uh, I think until we address them at each level, uh, we're gonna continue to see a slow uh, in uh, uptake in, uh, in the remaining population that remains at risk for HIV injection. Right. Thank you for laying that out um, so clearly. Um, Nicholas, I'd like to come to you and sort of piggyback off of that. Um, given your experience um, and work, how have you seen discrimination and other social determinants um, that relate to health outcomes for Black and Brown queer men impact PrEP uptake, HIV prevention? Um, can you talk about how um, the comprehensive nature of outreach? Um, since I just initially started working in PrEP and PEP um, from a community of color, I've initially already um, heard people just saying they didn't want to be a test dummy and they didn't want to be a, a medical rat. And it's, this was five years ago, and I'm still hearing that same sort of talk from clients who, um, even if their parents are okay with it, some of our younger clients are like, oh, my parents don't want me to be on it because of this, um, because of the fact that they just still feel like it's a test drug, even though how many times you can tell them it's not a test drug, how many times, how many different trials it's been through, they still feel that way. Um, then also having limited access to available appointments um, has really been a problem with our trying to just keep clients on, especially with a lot of our clinics here on Staten Island in the communities of color. They're overwhelmed by like COVID vaccine testing, trying to get people on the vaccine. So now it's like our availability appointments is very hard, especially most of our um, clients who are community of color who are working, they work nine to five. So there's not availabilities after five o'clock for them to get on this. So if it's it turns to Saturday and I can't even get an appointment, when am I ever gonna really decide to start this? Um, so that's one of the things we really haven't seen. Right, um, thank you for sharing that. And William, do you see similar distrust um, between community and providers? Um, what are some of the challenges that you see and how does discrimination impact um, from your experience prep uptake? Of course, um, I agree. Um, on top of that as well, there is the fact of bringing out awareness. I've found that a lot of members of uh, our community simply may not know what it is and or there's a lot of stigma around it, like it's the boogeyman disease. So it's like, you don't want anything to do with it, right? And then there's a lot of misinformation uh, going, but it goes even deeper than that. Um, a lot of members of the community, for instance, they don't wanna go to a clinic. They don't wanna, they don't wanna have to go in and get blood drawn. Um, there's, a, there's a stigma around hospitals in general as well. Like a lot of my clients who I bring in may not feel comfortable going into the clinic, which is why we go with them. We take them, we introduce them, we try to kind of give them a rundown. It's because uh, being fair, even coming from me, like three years ago, uh, back when I had to go into doctors to get STI screens, it was always nerve wracking. Um, one of the funniest things that um, a doctor told me was, I came in and they took my blood pressure and it was super high and they were like, okay, we're gonna take at the end of the meeting and then after they took it again, it lowered so much and they said, you were just nervous. So I know a lot of it is combating that, right? It's meeting them and trying to both explain what it is and also help them feel comfortable with it because there is a lot of distrust there. Uh, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. I also share that like fear or anxiety whenever I'm in the doctor's office 
and it's not my first rodeo, so I could only imagine how um, that acts as a deterrent. Um, I just want to agree with William. Sorry, I'm not. I've no, had that course. similar problem. I'm like, I take the blood pressure when I get there. And just because whatever, as a black man, when you get to the doctor, you never know what they're going to tell you. I'm like, I have to wait until the end of it. Um, but I do find that clients are more willing to like actually go through with the couple prep appointments when somebody walks them to the clinic, stays with them at the clinic, make sure they have the care after um, the doctor. Like sometimes the doctor will like say they wrote a script. They don't know what's going on. The client's confused. They may never start it. So it's like having that hand holding for those um for specifically specifically for a community of color thank you thank you for putting a fine point on that um Jala, i want to come to you would you like to add anything to this discussion from your experience how discrimination and other social determinants impact prep uptake hiv prevention um or anything related to this topic accessing challenges Oh, do we have enough? Do we have enough time? Okay, so, <laughs> um, so part of what I'm what I'm seeing is that you know we are we we're we're living in a new age where we're still holding on to old mindsets, right? We're still, especially when it comes to community based organization, when it comes to data, when it comes to telling people what they need, right? We're still in a mindset saying we see the number, so clearly you're at risk, but not really fully assessing the person and what their actual needs are. That actually brings them to these, you know to high risk um, behaviors. Um, and plus like on a community level, we're just oversaturated, right? We're the, going to the same bars to do outreach, going to the same places, going to reaching the same people. It's not, it's no longer working, but yet some people, that's why I don't work in organizations, still have to do these things because that's just what their jobs are telling them what to do. But we're not meeting the actual target audience. We're not clearly reaching people, right? And so it's always this unsaid elephant in the room and just saying we have the numbers, but yet we're not being um, productive in our in our work. And yes, people are going to be um, scared shitless of the way that we talk to them about these things as um, of, of just the way that we communicate with, um, with communities. Um, we're not doing the best job and de, um, using, uh, de, not using stigmatizing language, also telling people what they need, which is what benefit works for us. And I'm just like, clearly we are failing community if we are not doing the best. If these are what the numbers are saying, then clearly we're failing and we have to re-strategize. It's not for community to help, you know what I'm saying, to help us. We have to really just listen to on the ground why people not coming and really re-strategize that and really talk to our funders and say, this doesn't work for us. And you have to allow us to use this money the best way that we know how to um, target or how to help our communities versus what you say, because book, um, textbook and what's happening on the real ground doesn't match at all. So I, an important point I've heard among like multiple points is that you, having more discretion in using foundation funding to get more creative and outreach because the current stuff is getting a bit stale and isn't right efficient. No, that's a great point. Um, and I guess, Nicholas, I wanna come back to you quickly. Before we got on, you were talking about like an event that you recently hosted. Um, would you like to share with the audience like some of the creative solutions you folks out in Staten Island are trying to organize to get people engaged? Yeah, so here on Staten Island, unfortunately, we don't have a large LGBT community. Well, we do. They're just, there's no bars, really. There's no, like, gay nights or anything like that. So we're trying to create our own. So, like, this past weekend for um, Human, um, Human's Testing Day, we did a... Um, a brunch where if you got tested or you did a health screening, which included blood pressure, A1, um, A1C levels, you were able to come to um, a drag brunch for free, um, get a meal, and also build some sort of community here on Staten Island. A lot of the people there got to meet other people that they hadn't gotten to meet. Um, also, we had prep navigation there just um, so that everybody got tested, was able to speak to somebody about prep and pep, which led to about us actually getting about seven, uh, seven out of the 25 who showed up on to, well, to meet a prep provider um, they'll be doing that this week but we plan on doing more events like that just because it's part of building a community so the community can talk to each other about it I think also so and them starting to build have trust in CBOs and organizations so we're trying to develop more things like that hopefully one day I'll get to have John Love partner up with me on that since he's also on Staten Island <laughs> yeah that would be great um and maybe New Pride can get involved as well but yes. um 
is are there any this like reminds me of some of the service provision um like learning on their feet in the hospitals and organizations during COVID. Is there anything from any lessons or things that we've gained from COVID that have like improved access, whether it be virtual medicine? Um, this is a question for anyone who would like to take it, but essentially I just, my mind goes to all of the service provision that had to like be, be provided in different forms and that may have increased or um, hurt access as just trying to get a sense of what we all think on this panel. Um, I will say like from just trying to get clients in to see with COVID and everything, it turned into a real problem. It was really hard for people, especially during the quarantine to start prep or get to go to prep appointments. All of our clinics, our Planned Parenthood closed during the quarantine. We don't have a sexual health department, um, sexual health clinic at all. We have like two North Shore clinics and they were all submerged with COVID clients so it turned into a, a really hard to get clients to get appointments here on staten island um even when it came to like sti testing we were having trouble we've actually had to access um the sexual health clinics hotline a lot now for treatment for stis just because same day appointments is just so sparse and then trying to get somebody to go all in manhattan or brooklyn and there it's like they have two hours off before you know the clinics close at three o'clock has been hard so we've had to like try and move how we access things like and build new partnerships with different um, clinics around Staten Island and off the island and really utilize all of the virtual programs that they have. For, uh, for us, I can say that the pandemic did sort of encourage us to develop and, and maximize on the telemedicine platform, which I think especially for um, follow-up appointments, it has helped some individuals who, for example, uh, are working during the week, can't come in for an in-person visit, um, just have constraints on their available hours during the week. So telemedicine has sort of allowed for uh, easier follow-up uh, for some individuals. Yep. Uh, to me, what I see was just like the hypocrisy of it all, right? Um, community, communities, those activists and people that work with their community have to know how to multitask, but yet these health infrastructures <coughs> clearly that don't really know how to aid people of color was just all over the place, right? And then told us to really figure, figure it out. So my heart was really broken that, you know, said community-based organizations um, and institutions said that they have the funding and the dollar and know how to aid Black people or just people of color. But yet again, um, infrastructures was like, crumbled like it was um a piece of uh, like just so easy to crumble right and then have to rebuild and i i didn't understand like how can covid shift change when we clearly know how to deal with the epidemic that we could have used some of those mindsets to deal with this pandemic but it showed that we really don't have um strong infrastructures um and and i was just like Yet again, people are still going to fall through the cracks because said people that said they knew what they were doing clearly did not. So I just saw the hypocrisy. Like, how you expect me to do it all mm -hmm. and y'all have y'all shit together? Mm -hmm. um, piggybacking off of that as well, it is, um, it's been, it's been quite an experience too. Like, even teaching people the vernacular, like, hell, uh, heck, I mean, like, saying words like that, you know, like, Teaching people what to say when they go to the doctor um, can be difficult. Like knowing to ask for Gilead or PrEP app or ADAP, knowing what you need to ask for, like all that stuff. Um, that definitely it comes in handy. And it's it's something that you have to actually teach like um, the black community, the brown uh, POCs in general, it's because they may not know it. Um, I will say something that we learned from COVID um, before is we did a lot of in-person outreach, right? We did a lot of going to cruising spots, going to sex parties, going to all of that and trying to reach people where they're at, um, which similarly, which was said, sometimes going to the same bars may not be helpful, but during COVID, it actually opened us up to do uh, online outreach, right? So we're on social media now, like we've got a TikTok, you know? Um, so, but it may sound silly, but it actually reaches people really well, like being on Grindr, being on Jacked, being on hinge all of those dating apps that's where you find people and a lot of people in brooklyn in our community they're down low they're discreet they're not out right so meeting them where they are is a good way of opening that that um that conversation even if you open that conversation and then they 
ask you for something and you say, hey, no, I'm just a sexual health navigator. And then they stop talking to you. At the very least, now they know, right? They know that where they can go. I've had clients who spoke to me two months ago and then they'll reach out to me when they realize, hey, I might need something, right? Like, hey, can I get a take home HIV test that can be delivered to my house? Um, I know you talked about it like two months ago on Grinder, and I see you're still there, right? So I want to say that's been the biggest uh, learning curve for us is understanding that um, a lot of it is meeting them where they're at, doing these creative things, going to like, yes, going to Pride and whatnot is helpful, but some of our community may not be at Pride, like um, for Prep Aware Week and for Halloween, Camp was throwing a Halloween party, um, and it's open to anyone who wants to come. We're giving out raffles, there's a costume contest, you know, hopefully we'll have some drag queens. And we're trying to make sure that there it's 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 a safe space, but also a fun place and an educational place at the same time. Right. I think all of that, all of those points um, sort of touch on like thinking creatively about meeting the folks who aren't going to be at these spaces, aren't directly in the front lines of the queer community. Um, it, it reminds me of um, a recent federal um, rule regarding like free access to PrEP for anyone who has health insurance. Um, this was like a, I thought a huge win for folks um, when it came to the access. Do we still see any gaps in coverage in the cost of PrEP? Um, I know we talked about just um, processes and systems and how that could discourage folks. But if we're looking financially and through that perspective, are there any gaps or just generally, what are like the glaring gaps that you continue to see if we haven't touched on them already? I think a glaring gap is that a lot of the people, communities of color just don't know that there are access and ways for them to get it paid for. Like, unless they're on Medicaid, sometimes they just feel like, oh, it, it's gotta be trouble. So I'm just gonna think about it as trouble. I don't think that I have more clients who are white who will go all the way onto like Gilead's website, sign up for MAP, come in with their own MAP, um, Gilead MAP um, application, and they're halfway done just because they know about it or somehow their friend told them about it. Whereas in communities of color, um, we just, I guess they just, we don't talk more about that there is access and that it is free and how it could be a seamless thing. I agree with that. I find that um, PrEP, how it's advertised, it's very easy for um, middle-class white men to get on it, right? You know, like they know they're, they're already there. They're already signing up. They already got the Gilead. Um, I want to say it's a little more difficult for people in our community. Um, one of the problems we've had is understanding what free means, right? Because it, it does apply to your insurance. It applies to your rate of income. Um, and I know that's been a problem. We've had a couple of clients come in um, who didn't know that they needed to get a Gilead card, right? So then next thing you know, they get billed and then there's, a, there, they, there's your gap, right? So mm -hmm. like, it's that stuff. It's like knowing that when you go in, you have to make sure that you specify that you may need this, you may need that um, and all of that. And like, or for instance, some, I know some locations, they have a sliding scale if you don't have insurance, right? So like for coming into the doctor, they'll have a little sliding scale and they'll tell you whatever, how much money you make, this is how much you may be charged for that day and explain that before they go. It's cause I know that's a problem we've had with some clients who they'll go in and then they get a bill and then suddenly preps the no-go. And then also they've told all their friends that preps the no-go. So then mm -hmm. you get that or you'll run into people who said, my friend said this about it. So I wanna say that's definitely, that's definitely a gap that needs to be addressed. And just to kind of piggyback on farm, like we're talking a little bit about pharmacies, if it's not like a mom and pop pharmacy or a pharmacy connected to an agency that you can directly send somebody to, if I send somebody to just CVS or Rite Aid, CVS or Rite Aid is going to tell them, I'm sorry, it's not covered or whatever the bill is. They're not going to help them with Gilead Map. They're not going to say, hey, there's a card that you can literally do on your phone right now in line and then show. They're just like, hey, get out of my face. So mm -hmm. unless we get to send them to those type of, um, those type of pharmacies, then it does make it a little harder, um, especially with clients who... I'm in a hurry. I really want to start this. I'm going to have sex in the next seven days anyway. So if I don't start it, I don't start it. 
Well, and also one of the other things too that hopefully will improve access in, in terms of what we're discussing now is that the United States Preventative Services Task Force, this is the agency that makes age appropriate cancer screening recommendations for the US population, not too long ago made uh, PrEP for HIV prevention a grade A recommendation. And the reason why this is so important is that this then trickles down to insurance companies uh, whereby they are required to provide coverage for individuals at no cost, at no cost sharing for them uh, for PrEP and PrEP services. So hopefully as time goes on, we will find that from a financial standpoint, there will be fewer barriers to care uh, for the population. And one other thing that I do want to mention from a provider standpoint, I hear from patients all the time when they come into our office, they you know, fortuitously find us through uh, friends or social media. They tell us the reason I've, I've never started PrEP is because the doctor that I see for my primary care said that, oh, oh I don't need it, or I'm not at risk, or um, you know, some other sort of nonsense that they're getting. So I think barriers, while yes, there's plenty at a society level, I think unfortunately this even goes as high as at the level of the provider in the healthcare system. And I think we need to do better, a better job as medical providers at uh, discussing these options with our patients so that we can uh, improve sexual health uh, across the board. Yeah, I did not agree. Would you like to add any more or? I, um, you know, I think that we're also forgetting to, we're also leaving out the, the positive, the HIV positive population, right? When discussing PrEP, I don't understand why this is not a simultaneous conversation. When talking about you, you and PrEP, right? Um, there's mm -hmm. always this rush to find um, the positive people and then it's like, okay, you get it on treatment, right? And there's always rush to find these negative people as if there's not people in between, right? Um, me, un um, maintaining my undetectable status for since 2008, you know what I'm saying? That I'm also brought into the conversation as far as like, if my part, if I am with a partner in a monogamous relationship, is that even a conversation to have with my partner? If I mm -hmm. am, you know, scientifically proven that I cannot transmit the virus to my partner, right? And mm -hmm. so having these, um, these continued conversations and letting people know their options, I think that's one of the things that really um, upsets me about half of all these um, processes and just, you know, again, letting people know what their options are is just saying, this is just the best choice for you. Because it's mm -hmm. really, someone hears that in, a, in a, such in a different way. And again, talk about a provider standpoint. Yes, there are so many providers out there with their complicit biases. That is evident that is um, harming black men, period. Um, you know, and, and, and we really need to re we really need to have those conversations and restructure, right? I mean, when they was getting the check said providers to push said drugs, people were on certain drugs. Now you get into that, but that's a fact. Now that there's no initiative that we community said that is not okay, you know, there's no conversation of pushing certain um, treatments. So these mm -hmm. are just these are facts that we have to also understand that the community is not stupid. We know what's going on, and so therefore. Don't sell us a bed of roses when we know how things go. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, I, the provider point is such a good one. I've had shoddy experiences with providers, have had to ask providers about PrEP myself. Um, and so it just, it's unfortunate. It makes me think that maybe there's like a need for like some sort of green book throughout the city that's it's sad but just like that highlights providers that are queer friendly providers that take initiative just so that folks aren't doing like the heavy lifting themselves and being discouraged by trial and error um it's not a solution i'm just trying to think of ways that we could kind of organize around this problem but this brings up sort of my last line of inquiry before we, we get to an activity and then a survey. Um, what are like generally, in addition to what we've been talking, some like community resources that can be leveraged, um, socioeconomic supports, improved access, general support throughout New York City and, or excuse me, New York State and their goal to end the epidemic. How can we better leverage sort of the resources at our disposal to achieve these goals? And this is for everyone, whoever wants to start us off. I will, I will start off. I would say that um, me personally, we need to, we need to do better 
have better cross collab um, collaborations by with the Department of Health. You know, if a, if a person's coming into a community-based organization, there is some sense of level of care and how to aid that person. But if they're walking into just a regular Department of Health to get tested, some of the people that work there, no shade, just don't know how to deal with community, right? They just there to do their job and don't really handle people with care. In my personal opinion, I think we need to do better, um, better cross collaboration or better um, training for those that work in non-traditional, um, let's say, community-based organization, um, so that you know there's a culture competency there. I mean, right? So we need to just, I think, have a a great manual or uh, um, training that, when it comes to these non-structural institutions, that comes with a better hand and care. When, when it comes to community, that they have that strong sense as well, because somebody experienced that goes to a community-based organization is completely different. Um, when they go to just a department of health, they just gonna get tested and they just treat it as a number. Um, and also vice versa, because you know, some places I'm gonna say, well, community based organization handle people with care. So um, that's what I, I would love to see more. I, I agree on that one. I definitely think that there needs to be a training. Um, it's because similarly, um, I'm just gonna piggyback off of everything you said, kind of, but um, like when you, when you go into the clinic, right? A lot of times I remember, cause I, I go with my clients, right? On their first visit, there'll be times you're sitting in the office and you'll hear the secretary um, talking about the client and we're sitting right there, right? And like, and also knowing how to navigate not only um, uh, uh, culturally different spaces but also navigating LGBTQIA plus spaces, right? It's because uh, we don't, um, here's something that we haven't brought up today, but like when someone who may be, be involved with sex work, right, there's always that, that, that pause, right, when you're talking to your doctor, when you have to explain why you might need something, and then it's all about, like, it could be small, it could be just a facial quirk, and then suddenly you don't feel comfortable with this doctor anymore. So it's like, we definitely need to get those trainings down, we need to get people ready to talk, to talk about these topics. We need to make sure that our clients, make, make sure the community feels comfortable going in, comfortable explaining things. It's because there are also some um, locations and services that would help them more, right? Like, for instance, there is, uh, I know some of the clinics we go to, there's like programs for sex workers, but if you don't feel comfortable saying you are one, then right. you're, not, you're not doing that service. So mm -hmm. I want to say, the training is definitely important. Um, we need to make sure that we feel safe when we go in there. And also, oh, thank you. Oh, wait. To, Sorry. To, piggy to, <laughs> to piggyback off of that, um, William, I think, I think it's also important to have a staff that sort of mimics your target population, right? I think it's important to have a diverse clinical staff so that you can really relate to your patient population at a more personal level you know, have staff that are diverse in uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, of trans experience, I think it's incredibly important because unless you create a welcoming environment for your clientele, you can forget about having them come back for follow-up. Thank um, you. And just to piggyback on the trainings, I think they need to be mandated. They need to be New York State mandated for all, everybody across the board. Um, we need to figure out who's not comfortable seeing um, the LGBT community, who's not okay with saying, we're talking to people who um, say, I do sex work, who say, I went to a sex party last night, no matter what, you shouldn't blink an eye. So we can hopefully get this green book one day so I can send clients to more than one than four agencies or have to have them go to those cold very cold sexual health clinics, even though they try and make them, mm -hmm. they still seem cold and die and just not very welcoming. So just some affirm trainings that people have to attend. So I, you know, we have, a, what is it, the, say like the ETE program or New York City Department of Health has a couple of clinics, say Mount Sinai, Aperture, Cal and Lore, but like, let's grow beyond that. I agree, right? Because we could mandate healthcare workers to be vaccinated. I think it's up to mandate to have training. Mm -hmm. um, aside from the content, William, go ahead. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I've been talking a lot, but no. also it goes, it goes also towards advertising. I touched on this earlier, but um, some of this stuff is advertised. I, it's a little better now than it was like 10 years ago. But it, it can be advertised to not our community, right? It's, it's more or less pushed towards um, cis uh, white men, right? 
And it, even like in my department, like we had to unpack two months ago because we went to an event and we were talking and we were so proud, right? We had all of our advertisements, we had our flyers up, it had black and brown men uh, in the community. And then we had a trans woman come up and say, where are the trans women, right? Like it, it, it's, it, it go, it, we have to be deep, right? Like not only training it for providers, but also for us and then also advertising, make sure that we are showcasing this to the people who need it. And also make sure that we are showcasing it to all the people who need it. Yeah, thank you for adding that point. I was just gonna say the content was great. Intentionality, um, amplifying discussions, making trainings mandatory, but then also it was a surgical round robin. Everyone piggybacked off each other. So it was great to end on that note. Um, I think we have a quick activity that we're going to do with the audience. Um, so there should be a poll that pops up on your screen um, any second now. Um, take an opportunity to answer these questions, true or false, after you're done. We'll go around as a panelist and take them each. Um, number one, I'll just read them. Prep makes individuals more promiscuous, true or false. Number two, PrEP can interfere with hormone replacements, true or false. Number three, once you start PrEP, you can never stop. Number four, I can take PrEP only on the day I'll know I'll have sex. Number five, I don't need to wear condoms while on PrEP. And number six, PrEP has no side effects. So just gonna give a couple of seconds for folks in the audience to answer this before reveal the correct answers. Uh, 20 more seconds. Get those final answers in. Awesome. So I'll take the first one and then I'll ask my fellow panelists to take the other. So number one, true or false prep makes individuals more promiscuous. This is false, nothing in prep makes patients more promiscuous. Um, so overwhelming majority of us got that right. Number two, Dr. Bernardo, do you mind taking it? Sorry. Um... So number two uh, reads, uh, PrEP can interfere with hormone replacements. So uh, no, that is uh, incorrect. Oral PrEP drugs do not raise or lower levels of gender affirming hormones. Um, hormones taken by uh, transgender women may slightly lower one of the drugs in PrEP, particularly tenofovir, but if taken daily, it's not enough to affect the efficacy. So uh, trans individuals who are on gender affirming hormone therapy should feel comfortable taking daily PrEP without a risk of either lowering the efficacy of PrEP or interfering with their gender affirming uh, hormone therapy. Thank you so much. Um, Nicholas, number three, do you mind taking it? Once you start PrEP, you can never stop. I think you're muted. Once you start, true or false, once you start PrEP, you can never stop. Um, one can always stop taking PrEP, although taking the medication regularly is necessary for building protection against HIV. So you can stop PrEP if you need to, if there's any reason. Sometimes you call it seasons where you want to be on PrEP and you know, but just know you have to take it regularly for it to be in your system. Thank you so much. Um, William, number four, I can take PrEP only on the day I know I'll have sex. Can you take that one? Um, that one is also false. <clears throat> uh, PrEP must be taken daily for a period of time before having um, sex. Uh, inversely, you can take PEP on demand. So if you've been exposed to um, the virus, you well, within 72 hours, you can then take PEP and you take it for 28 days and you can get it out of your system. Thank you so much. And then Jala of number five, I don't need to wear condoms while on prep. Mm. 
So that's also um false for number five. Mm -hmm. It says press the, um, prep does not um, protect against um other S other STIs or STDs, just um HIV. So that is definitely false. Yes. Um, it's important to practice comprehensive sexual wellness and okay. care. Um, and I'll just end it. Number six, PrEP has no side effects. This is also false. There are short-term side effects. These are, however, more common, like nausea, diarrhea, headaches. They usually only occur when you begin and then they sort of fade away. So short-term, not too severe. There are also a couple rare long-term side effects. These are much less common liver and kidney damage, bone density damage, um, stuff that your doctor or physician has to tell you about, but it's very rare. Of course, none of us outside of Dr. Bernardo are physicians. And so we highly recommend you take any of this information and follow up with um, your local physician or clinician who has some facts to put behind um, all of this information. Um, I think that's it with the activity. I wanna give an opportunity for folks on the panel to give final thoughts at the same time, there's gonna be a survey that's live. Um, is that possible to do Sandrine? Can we do that at the same time? Um, yes, yeah, so if you look into the chat, there's like a survey that you can click and take. Um, at the same time, I wanna give any of the panelists who may wanna give some final thoughts an opportunity to do so. I've learned a ton from the past 45 minutes and it's been fun. Um, usually this kind of gets a bit stale, but I've had a great conversation with all of you all. Um, and of course, many more instances of collaboration in the future, but to anyone who wants to give final thoughts. Uh, I'll start off. Um, I would like to say, if you work for any community-based organization, health infrastructure, and see that there is a lack or a trust of community that wants to walk into your space, challenge the infrastructure that you work for. Do not challenge community, challenge the infrastructure that you work for, because community knows safe spaces. And if you're not one as identified, then you have to change that. And don't be afraid to be an agent of change, because that's what helps us, um, that just helps us overall as human beings and saving our humanity. Thank you, Jala. Appreciate it. Uh, I'll go ahead and say that everyone on this webinar now is a little bit more knowledgeable. Um, and so we should all be part of the solution and work together toward ending the HIV epidemic. Thank you, doctor. I just want to want to, want, want to once again say, let's talk about these mandated trainings. I'm tired of sending clients to people who have no idea what they said. I've had people literally be turned away for PEP. Like, oh, I'm sorry. I don't think you qualify for PEP. Sweetie, that's because you don't talk to the client enough for them to want to tell you why they need to be on PEP because you're not making a welcoming space. So let's get more into that. Um, and to just what I've learned through the quarantine is really what William was saying is to rely on meeting people where they're at. We've really gotten a lot of clients through um, through Grinder, Scruff, Jagged, Hinge, just talking to clients, and now they're repetitive clients because of that. Even if it was just for a home test kit. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, that was that was kind of what I was gonna say. Uh, definitely, um, meet meeting uh, meeting the community where they're at, um, and trying to do it do it in unique ways, right? Um, that doesn't always mean going to Pride. That might mean going to Prospect Park for if we're in Brooklyn. Like it's a it's a it's a big cruising spot. Um, so sometimes what we do is we'll go out there. Uh, we don't ask questions. We're just like, hey, do you need condoms? Hey, do you mind uh, talking about prep for a few seconds? So you know, um, kind of just figuring out new ways to approach situations um, and keep it fun, right? Uh, a lot of times people come forward and like I said, it, it's kind of like a boogeyman disease. It's like, hey, I remember like some things that you have to tell people is uh, um, number one, being on prep is like taking a vitamin once a day. It's, it's fine. You'll be all right. And then inversely, similarly to what was talked about earlier, um, we also have to remember that these are two different, we, these are two communities in the same conversation. So for HIV positive people, um, it's not the end of the world, you know? You can achieve a U equals U status and um, that means you can go live your life normally. 
it just keep going, <laughs> you know? So that's why I'm always like, keep it. It doesn't have to be, hey, this is, this is, this is serious medical stuff. No, it's like, hey, you know, this is every day. This is what mm -hmm. we do. Yes. Thank you for that, William. I know Jalov said period while you were giving that little um, U equals U testimony. But I also want to extend the thanks to everyone on this panel. I've learned a ton. Shout out to the tech team, um, Saints, for dealing with what we had to earlier in this meeting. It feels like a completely different meeting. And that goes to you all for making sure that um, those trolls were gone. And thank you to the audience members who have been listening, asking questions, learning. Um, this has been recorded, and so we'll post it on our website and our YouTube um, and send it out through our listserv. There should be a, a slide of local resources, um, more info about everyone on the panel, plus Department of Health um, and our organizations. Thank you all so much for joining. It's kind of a beautiful fall Wednesday, and so maybe go on a walk have lunch outside. I'm going to try to do something along those lines. And so enjoy. I'll see you in the future.